Hello everyone, my name is Jin Jin Yu. Today, I will be presenting our Wafer 2020 work titled On Rearrangement of Items Stored in Stacks. This is a joint work with my colleague Mario Sazzetti. Let me start with the formulation of the stack rearrangement problems. In the unlabeled setting or partially labeled setting, we are given nd items stored in n stacks, each of which has a capacity of d. These items are of n types. Each type has d items. Initially, these items are mixed in these stacks. Using a manipulator and an actual empty uh, stack, we would like to sort these items so that each stack contains items of the same type. It is assumed that only items on the top of a stack may be removed and then subsequently placed um, in a stack that is not full. In the fully labeled setting, which is not shown here, each item has a unique number and must occupy a specific location within a stack in the Go configuration. Now, as it turns out, for this problem, the fully labeled setting does not add much more challenge, so we mainly focus on the unlabeled setting in this presentation. In solving the problem, we would like to minimize the number of pop and push operations, which is quite natural. The problem uh, finds many applications, including the handling of containers at ports and the rearranging of items on store shelves, and so on. In terms of the bounds, the lower bound is relatively easy to establish, that is, how many pop pushes will be required to solve a random instance. For the unlabeled setting or partially labeled setting, we observe that every pop push induces a branching factor of n squared because there are uh, n stacks where we can pop an item, and once an item is popped, the, uh, that item can go to about n um, stacks. So it's n times n, uh, which gives us n squared. On the other hand, if we count the total number of possible instances, uh, this gives us about n to the ndth power. So combining these two, we get that we will need omega nd power pushes to solve a random instance. Now for the label setting, we will re uh, require a little bit more. That is, we might need nd log d uh, over log n number of pop pushes. In terms of the upper bound, the previous best known upper bound is by Han ETL from IL uh, 2018. So for the unlabeled setting, they provided a nd log n uh, algorithm. And then for the fully labeled case, they provided an algorithm that can compute a solution uh, within nd log n plus log d pop pushes. So, so uh, our contribution in this paper is as follows. We develop an algorithm that only require O N D number of pop pushes as long as uh, D over N is a constant. This does not require you know, D is a constant or N is a constant. And this applies to both labeled and the unlabeled uh, settings. An interesting intermediate result that we develop is the Rubik table uh, problem, which we'll introduce next. The Rubik table problem is defined as follows. Given an n times n uh, square filled with n types of items of n each, 
Now in a shuffle, one may take out a row or take out a column and shuffle that row or column arbitrarily and then put that back. So this is count, uh, counted as one shuffle. The question we ask is, how many shuffles are needed for realizing an arbitrary reconfiguration of this table? For example, going from the left configuration to the right ordered configuration. Somewhat surprisingly, uh, we show that the Rubik table problem can be solved using only two n shuffles. That is, we'll perform some n column shuffle, uh, column shuffles, and then some n row shuffles, and that actually allows us uh, to solve the problem. Now from here, we easily observe that if we further have every single item uh, being fully labeled, then that problem can be solved using three n shuffles. Because after we solve the unlabeled version using two n shuffles, we can then shuffle every column one more time right, to get to the fully labeled ordered setting. Next, we'll provide a proof sketch for the algorithm that solves the Rubik table problem in two n shuffles. The key step in the algorithm is to permute each column. So we reach the situation where the n items destined to go to a given column, for example, a given color, will end up in different rows. So um, this may look a little bit convoluted, but let me explain using a straightforward example. Suppose we want to take this 4x4 four four, uh, Rubik table with four colors, uh, green, red, orange, and cyan. And we want to get to this ordered uh, setting where uh, the items are ordered from left to right, red, green, cyan, and orange. So how do we do this? We first construct a bipartite graph based on this original Rubik table. For one of the parted set, we use the colors R, G, C, and O. For the other parted set, we use the column number C1, C2, C3, C4. We add an edge between a color and a column. Right? If in the original configuration, that color appears in that column. So uh, for red, we have these edges. We see that red appears in column two once. So there's one edge, appears in column three once, one edge, right? It appears in column four twice. So we have two edges from uh, red to column four. We can do this readily for all the other uh, colors and columns. Now, once we get this bipartite graph, this is a uh, regular bipartite graph, which means uh, every vertex has the same degree, in this case, four. Now, we'll uh, try to obtain a matching uh, on this bipartite graph. Now, this is guaranteed by house matching theorem. As an example, we might obtain this um, four edges as the first matching. Now we will use this, um, this matching to construct an intermediate Rubik table that gets us from the initial configuration to the goal configuration. So what we do is we take this matching and we put it in a row of this intermediate table. That is, because um, green is matched to C1, we put it in column one. Red is matched to C2, we put that to column two. 
cyan is matched to C3, we put it into column 3, uh, orange um, in column 4. Now we can then uh, delete that set of edges from the bipartite graph, uh, and then we again um, are left with a regular bipartite graph with uh, one degree less. Then we run another matching uh, on this bipartite graph. We can get another matching as shown in this blue color. And that gives us another row uh, in the intermediate um, table. We, in this case, have orange in column one, um, green in column two, cyan column three, red in column four. And we can keep doing this and exhaust all the edges from the original bipartite graph, and then we can fill our intermediate table. Now, from this table, we observe that we actually uh, preserved the um, number of items in each color in every column. So for the first column, we see that there are two green right in the uh, table above and two greens in the table below one orange in the table above, one orange in the table below, one cyan in the um, table above, and one cyan in the table below. This is true for all the other columns. This means that we can perform n column shuffles to go from the top uh, table to this bottom right table. Now, at this point, we observe that every color due to the matching, uh, appears in each row only once. That means next we can shuffle each row and get to this desired Go configuration. Now, of course, we can uh, also perform one more round of column shuffles if we want to fully sort uh, the labeled case. So this is uh, a proof sketch of how this algorithm would work so that we can solve the Rubik's, uh, Rubik table problem in 2n shuffles for the um, unlabeled or partially labeled setting and 3n shuffles if we want to solve the fully labeled setting. As it turns out, the Rubik table result readily generalizes to uh, have additional dimensions. Here we'll introduce one of this uh, so-called fat Rubik table problem, which we will use to solve the stack rearrangement problem. So here we are given an n times n times k prism filled with n types of items of n k each. Again, in a shuffle, we can permute any single fat row or fat column. So here a fat row would be one of this row of the first table on the, in the front, and then uh, the corresponding row in every other table uh, behind. And similarly, we can define uh, fat columns. So the question then is, how many shuffles are needed for realizing an arbitrary reconfiguration of this fat, uh, fat Rubik table? As it turns out, um, we don't need additional number of shuffles. The same result uh, from before holds, that is, the fat Rubik table uh, can be reconfigured using 2n shuffles. And then uh, if we have labels, then we need one more round of shuffle. So we will need 3n shuffles if we want to solve the labeled fat Rubik table problem. With the Rubik table problem, the fat Rubik table problem and the associated algorithms, we can now describe our algorithm for solving the stack rearrangement problem using only O and D pop pushes when D uh, divided by N is a constant. So what we will do is we fix an arbitrary N then we recursively add depths uh, to stacks, starting with d equals 1, and then d equals square root of n, and so on. So here we can assume that uh, 
n is a perfect square. So we will focus on the case of going from d equals 1 to d equals square root of n. All the others are similar their induction. So in the case of d equals 1 and n equals 16, right, we can readily solve this problem by using that uh, uh, single um, buffer stack. So in the case of n equals 16, where we have 16 stacks, <clears throat> plus an empty buffer stack, and each stack has a capacity of 4. What we will do is we will try to simulate uh, fat Rubik table operations, that is, fat column shuffles and fat row shuffles, and then we can directly apply the result to establish what we want. So how do we do this? We start with a Rubik table, and we work with the first four columns, or first four stacks from the left. What we are going to do is we're going to move these stacks to the top uh, position of each stack. This can be done by first take one stack, move that stack to the buffer, right, and then um, move the top items of the right four stacks into this now empty stack and then um, put what is in the buffer into uh, onto the top of these four stacks right we can then repeat this um, and get every one of this uh, um, get the content of the left four stacks onto the top of the 16 uh, stacks this will take OD squared number of pop pushes in total. Now from there, uh, we can do an arbitrary shuffle of this uh, in linear amount of pop pushes, that is OD squared number of pop and pushes. And then we can reverse what we have done and put the shuffled um, items back to the first four uh, stacks. So what we have done so far is that we have simulated an operation of um, a fat column shuffle. Now uh, we can of course apply the same to the next four stacks and then the next four stacks and then the next four stacks. Now uh, after we do the column shuffle, then we can uh, also do fat row shuffle. We treat every other four um, stacks as a um, fat as as stacks in a fat row as illustrated in this figure here now with that we can actually solve the entire problem by directly applying the fat rubik table result to summarize and conclude in this work we provided a much better upper bound for solving the stack rearrangement problem. For d equals n to the m over 2, where m is some um, integer, for the unlabeled stack rearrangement problem, we can solve it using O2 to the m times nd number of pop pushes. For the labeled setting, we can solve it in O3 to the m times nd pop pushes. This means that as long as m is a constant, then we can solve the problem using a linear um, number of pop pushes with respect to the number of items in the stacks. Now this almost matches the lower bound. We also provided a a useful and interesting Rubik table result. As it turns out, that result can be applied to solve other problems like multi-robot motion planning. So we leave a few uh, open questions as perhaps food for thought. One of this is, is the stack rearrangement problem NP-hard? We think so, but we were not able to so far uh, 
prove or disprove. And then, could we further narrow the gap between the upper and lower bound? We're pretty close, but there's still some, uh, some gap there. And then, could we explore other in interesting models? For example, maybe we can use multiple buffers. We did some very brief study of that in this work, um, but there certainly could be more work done here. And then uh, we could also try to work with other queuing models. For example, we might work with uh, a kind of a stack that you can work from both ends. Or you, know, you can work with this Rubik table where you can go not only from the top, but also from the side. With that, I conclude this presentation. Thank you.